Hi everyone. Now we are going to discuss a topic called calorimetry. So what is a calorimetry? It's a technique or optical method used to estimate the concentration of biochemical compounds in our laboratories. Okay, and that name of the technique is calorimetry and the instrument that we are using for this technique is being called as calorimeter. So here is a figure of a digital calorimeter. And then coming to the topic of this calorimetry, it's a most widely used optical method to estimate the concentration of biochemical compounds in laboratories. So when light is passed through a colored solution, assume that some light was passed through a colored solution, some wavelengths are absorbed more in comparison to the others. The quantity of light absorbed is proportional to the intensity of the color. So the best example if you are going to take two glasses of water, one is a plain water, pure water and other with of some uh, sherbet or some colored solution. Okay, and if you transmit the light in to the both of the glasses, then you can observe the clarity of the light. So this clarity of the light is going to show that this colored solution has absorbed some light. That's why the light passing through this colored glass is somewhat dim. Okay, so that the same principle is being implied in this colorimetry also. Uh, when a light suppose this pass through a colored solution some wavelength or absorb more in comparison to the other that is what our, we have taken the plain water the quantity of light absorbed is directly proportional so whatever the light that is absorbed is directly proportional to the concentration of the compound that is present in the solution this relationship between the quantity of uh, light absorbed and the concentration of the compound is being explained by the principle that was given by Mr. Uh, Beer and Lambert. These two are different uh, scientists and the name together as we are having a combination of these two laws we call it as Beer Lambert's law. Okay, so let's come to the topic of uh, principle regarding the calorimetry. This technique is based on the interaction of light energy with color solutions, isn't it? So that's the thing that we are going to have here. Then coming to the B. Lambert's law. So what is a B. Lambert's law? First, uh, you should know this uh, law because the last principles we have to by heart them. But here I'll give you a, a small trick where there is no need to by heart. This law states that the fraction of incident light. What is this incident light? The light that is being falling on the substance. For example, as we are assuming this as a glass of water, isn't it? The light that is being incident on the glass of water, okay? And at a given wavelength, that means we are going to have the projection of some wavelength, is related to the thickness, that means the thickness of the glass. Some may be of very thick and some may be of very thin thickness of the glass and to the thickness of the absorbing layer by by the and the concentration of the ab, uh, sorry absorbing species or the solute particles so here three things you have to remember one is the concentration of the instant light so concentration of the solute particles that are present in the solution and then the wavelength of the instant light and the absorbing layer. What is the thickness of this absorbing layer? So these three factors comes into the play of how much of the light that should be transmitted outside. Now this transmitted light, whatever the light come out of the glass of water is directly proportional to the concentration of this solute particles that are present in the glass of water. The same thing is being explained in the form of a law by this B. Lambert's. This law states that the fraction of instant light, this is the fraction of instant light, absorbed by a solution, that is this solution, at a given wavelength is related to the thickness of the absorbing layer. So this is going to be considered as a thickness and the concentration of the 
absorbing species so that's all uh, that is all about the b lambert's law so when it is going to be in the uh, form of a formal representation a is equal to log 10 i naught by i that which is also equal to epsilon l c what is this i naught and i i naught is the one which is the incident beam of light what is this one incident beam of light whereas i is the transmitted light okay i is going to be minus that's why i is going to be the transmitted light then what is this epsilon so epsilon is a molar coefficient or molar absorptive co coefficient and this l is the path length so the distance of this glass uh, or this cuvette whatever we are taking and then the c is the concentration of the solute particles so these are the things that are going to have in the form of a formal representation that is a is equal to log 10 i naught by i is equal to epsilon l c and i mentioned that this is a combination of two laws that is beats law and lambert's law let's see that one in individual form so here is the what i told you it's a combination of two simple laws one is a bead law and another one is a lambert's law so what did the bead law says this law states that the amount of light absorbed is directly proportional to the concentration of absorbing species what are the absorbing species here the solute now according to the Bates law the absorbance a is equal to log 10 i naught by i is equal to epsilon c we have already seen what is the i naught i naught is the intensity of incident radiation or light i is the intensity of transmitted radiation or light epsilon is the molar coefficient and c is the concentration of the solute particle or absorbing species so according to the Beer's law here the absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration of the species he said then according to the lambert's law he said that absorbance is directly proportional to e l what is it l is the path length of the absorbing layer so here a is equal to log 10 i naught by i is equal to epsilon l so this is what uh Beats law and the lambert's law is saying one is saying that absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration of absorbing species another one is saying that absorbance is directly proportional to the path length of the thickness of the absorbing layer now putting these two together so a is common here absorbance both are saying about the absorbance and we know that uh, absorbance is equal to log 10 by i naught by i so that's the same thing we have written here log 10 i naught by i in both the things the common is that one and we have removed the proportionality the direct proportional so we have got a quotient called as epsilon so we got the epsilon here which is common in both the things and what the difference here is the concentration and here is the path length. So both, both are going to be kept here. So the path length and the concentration. So that's how it has become the complete B Lambert's law, which says the absorbance is directly proportional to the incident light absorbed by at a given wavelength is related to the thickness of the absorbing layer and the concentration of the absorbing species okay i hope so you understood this principle very clearly now let's move to the structure of a typical calorie meter so what is the structure of a typical calorie meter how it uh, looks like and how what is the things that are going to be of uh, this thing and how it functions everything let's see in the structure the instrument so i showed you the calorimetry instrument here this is the instrument so we won't see all the parts externally so what is present in the internal we have it in the diagrammatical representation okay so these are the components of a typical calorimeter so what are those things one is the source of light here the source of light you are going to have the mercury lamp or a light bulb then you are going to have a slit which is going to be of a aperture we call it as and then we are having a condenser lens okay then we are having a filter okay and then the cell or cuvette 
uh, or the place where we are going to place it and then you are going to have the photo cell and finally this photo cell after taking it is going to pass the reading to the galvanometer nowadays we are having the digitalized one and uh, these are all the components of a typical calorimeter once again a light source okay or source of light maybe a tungsten lamp and then you are going to have a uh, sorry slit aperture and then condenser lens a filter a cuvette and photo resistor or photo cell and a galvanometer so how it is going to work let's see the beam of light that is being projected from this uh, light source is passed through a slit so this is a slit so it is going to have to raise all the thing but the rays that are passing only through the slit is going to be fall on the condenser okay now what is this condenser is doing what is the function of this condenser the condenser is the one which merges all the rays of the path and allows them to flow only in one direction that is the function of a condenser whether here or in the microscope so here the beam of light that is passing through the slit and to a condenser lens and falls on the cuvette by passing through the filter that is a cuvette or an absorption cell containing the sample solution now the light then is transmitted from the colored molecules through the uh, different uh, filters obviously and then its wavelength or measured by the photo cell and you are going to have so here also actually we are supposed to have some filters in the, some calorimetry instruments where it is going to be removed the further transmitting light uh, other than the single wavelength and now this photo cell will detect those electrons and they will transmit that in the form of reading that can be seen on the galvanometer and nowadays we are using the optical uh, displays so where we can directly write the optical density that is uh, called as OD generated in the photo cell is measured by either sensitive galvanometer or by the optical density distal things so this is the overall structure of a typical calorimeter so once again the from the light source or source of light the light is being passed through the slit and this slit from the slit it falls on the condenser and this condenser allow the rays to pass through a filter and again after that uh, it passes through the cuvette and it absorbs the uh, condenser light and it is going to have the passage of the light and that light is going to be uh, for uh, taken by the the light reading is going to be taken by this photo detector or photo cell and that optical density generated is going to be uh, generated by this photo cell was going to be measured by this relative galvanometer so this is all about the structure of a typical calorie meter then coming to the applications so we are having so many applications so unless and until we had applications we won't use any instrument unnecessarily isn't it so what are those applications that we are using so with the help of calorimeter most of the biochemical experiments can be done that we know and then as a science or biological student we should know uh, we obviously know that we use the calorimeter more oftenly in our laboratories and then we use it to determine the concentration of biochemical compounds also that means estimation of the concentration in any unknown samples and then these are also being used in the estimation of biochemical samples like plasma, serum, CSF, that is cerebrospinal fluid, urine, uh, to identify uh, some compounds in the hospitals. Then quantitative estimation, as I told you, concentration of the quantitative is the same. Uh, for example, glucose estimation in the unknown sample, proteins estimation in the unknown sample, then RNA estimation in the unknown sample. Uh, for example, proteins, the biurate method can be used to estimate uh, the unknown sample. Then glucose carbohydrates by DNS method, that is dinatose salicylate method. All these things can be uh, done by using with the help of this calorimeter. And this is also being used in some food industries and by some manufacturers of paints and textiles. So these are the few applications of calorimetry that we are using in our laboratories okay 
So, uh, not only that, these reactions are often sensitive in most cases quite sensitive so that quantities of material in the region of millimole per liter concentration can be measured. That is also uh, one more advantage where we can find the millimole per liter concentration can also be provided. Okay, so and uh, there is no need of the complete isolation of uh, uh, compound is not necessary and the constituents of complex mixtures such as blood can be determined after little treatment. So because of all these beneficials, this calorimetry is being uh, useful in many of the biochemical experiments. Okay, so that's all about the calorimetry. I hope so you understood. Thank you.